My name is Rob Simpson and welcome to Directors Uncut. If this is your first episode, we put filmmakers from all genres and all corners of the globe onto a huge list that covers everything from mumblecore directors to French social realists. Then we turn it into a big lottery of directors by using the random number generator, whatever name comes out of the hat, myself and some guest hosts discuss them and their work through two films. This week I've been joined by Gav from my favourite film, hello there. Hello, how are you doing? Andy from Road to Nowhere. Hey, yeah. And Melissa from Ghouls Magazine, hello. Hello. Yes, this is my first two-parter, so no pressure. <laughs> 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 yeah, where's Craven? Where did you first hear of him? Where, what was the first movie that all three of you saw? I think the first time I actually fully became aware of him was watching Jane Silent Bob Strike Back, where <laughs> he makes an appearance. Uh, that would have been 14, I think, when that movie came out, waiting and renting out the cinema, and there's, I think they're doing like a kind of full scream movie with a monkey. Um, <laughs> and that was the first time I kind of... Fully became well in my 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 memory anyway. Last time I fully became aware of him, and then I kind of went back and caught Scream was the first one I as that yeah. I watched. Yeah, so um, Melissa, that's when I feel my age. Yeah, I feel like the Scream was also the first uh, Wes Craven film I saw. Um, I was yeah, I was the sort of prime age for it. I think I was fifteen when it came out. Um, had a slightly weird start with it as I actually watched it in France I was on holiday with my friend and her family we thought it would just be um in English with French subtitles but it was French dub so it was quite a unique <laughs> uh experience but it was still very enjoyable so that was my first first full Wes Craven film although yeah growing up in sort of late 80s early 90s um there was definitely like an awareness of Freddy Krueger as it's like a terrifying thing I remember in in the playground, you'd hear like Nightmare on Elm Street is the scariest film ever made, and that was just taken as truth. So I was kind of aware of aware of like Nightmare before ever seeing it. It's kind of a weird genesis for that movie, isn't it? How it became like the talk of playgrounds, yeah, mm. and mm. lunch boxes and everything they had, and yeah. toys marketed to kids. It's crazy. Yeah. I've got a ask list. Did I remember it? Or have I just got weird dreams? He wasn't a, like a rap video, wasn't he? Yeah, I'm course. pretty sure. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> just checking. Uh, yeah, I, I, was... I come from words from a, a completely different standpoint. I'm slightly older than I think all of you, because um, I remember Swamp Thing. I think I saw that on VHS <laughs> before Nightmare on Elm Street even appeared. Um, then Nightmare on Elm Street, I would have seen again probably on VHS. Uh, I would have <laughs> only been in my early teens, but yeah, it was a thing in the playground. So I remember Freddy Krueger as Fred Krueger. Because he was Fred Krueger in the original. Mm. He was always Fred. In fact, he is. When Wes Craven appears as Fred the janitor in Scream, that's his homage back to Fred Krueger from the film. So mm. he's even dressed as Freddy Krueger in that or Fred Krueger in that. So, yeah. Yeah. sorry. Being a geek and a nerd now. So <laughs> but we'll come back now and get to Scream probably. <laughs> so I've kind of stuck with Wes through most of his career from that point, picking up VHS copies when I was younger and then cinema when I got older. So. Hmm. By the time Scream came out, I was um, a slightly older again. So, yeah. Uh, just to repeat what I said from the uh, the part one, I was a, a Scream kid. I think uh, about twelve or thirteen at the time. So it was talk of the playground. Everybody was into yeah. it, but it was one of those things. Um, I experienced the sort of reflexive uh, sat- like sort of satire on slashes before I even knew what a slasher was. Yeah, mm. Mm. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot that I've heard a lot of that from people who have seen Scream as being their first horror that they never understood any of the things that go on in Scream until later on when they went back and watched all the old horror. I'm yeah. of the lucky generation that saw that old horror first and then got Scream, so we understood it a little bit better. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was kind of like that, yeah. Did you have the uh, the mask that poured blood down the face? That was a classic at high school. I'd <laughs> uh, <laughs> dress parties, it had a heart that pumped blood down the face of the mask. I remember yeah. having that. Yeah. I remember having a, a Terminator 2 doll, which you could sort of like put clear modelling skin on and pull its skin off. <laughs> that was for kids too. Yeah. Yep. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess we kind of just lent into that a little bit there. So I, I guess start off with 1996's Scream. Uh, hello? Why don't you want to talk to me? Who is this? Tell me your name, I'll tell you mine. 
I don't think so. What's that noise? Popcorn. You're making popcorn? Uh-huh. I only eat popcorn at the movies. Well, I'm getting ready to watch a video. Really? What? Oh, just some scary movie. You like scary movies? Uh-huh. What's your favorite scary movie? Uh, I don't know. You have to have a favorite. What comes to mind? Um, Halloween. You know, the one with the guy in the white mask who walks around and stalks babysitters? Yeah. What's yours? Guess. Um, Nightmare on Elm Street. Is that the one where the guy had knives for fingers? Yeah, Freddy Krueger. Freddy, that's right. I like that movie. It was scary. Well, well the first one was, but the rest sucked. So, you got a boyfriend? <laughs> Why, you want to ask me out on a date? Maybe. Do you have a boyfriend? No. You never told me your name. Why do you want to know my name? I want to know who I'm looking at. Abash it. Synopsizing that. Whoa. <laughs> not, not pressure. I mean, <laughs> give it a go. Just a little, uh, little plot synopsis. Go on, yeah. I mean, right, so. just on this front here, we, we, we're spoiling these. I mean, you oh, can't really that's... talk around the spoilers. It's, it's just no fun, really. Mm. Yeah, so I mean, just to sum it up, it's the the town of Woodsboro. Um, there's, you know, we start as a, what's now an iconic opening scene with uh, Drew Barrymore as Casey Becker, who is being uh, tormented by phone calls from a uh, a sort of deep, gravelly voiced man asking, uh, "What's your favourite scary movie?" Um, things escalate. She ends up um, being murdered. And this sparks off a wave of sort of serial killing focused around uh, Sydney Prescott and her friends. Gail Weathers, a national reporter, comes in who's written a, a previously a book about Sydney's the murder of Sydney's mother. Um, and then it all culminates in a house party with multiple murders, mayhem, and the reveal of the dual killers. Okay. Nice. Pretty spot on there, yes. Um, Pretty good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, what are our feelings on this one? I love it. <clears throat> I love the the whole franchise generally, but I think, um, and I kind of, personally, I kind of flip between Scream or Scream 2 as my favourite. Hmm. But the way this, I mean, in the 90s, there was a lot of, maybe not shit horror. I don't know if that's maybe the best way to describe it. No, but no. It's, <laughs> it was, totally was. <laughs> it was. And this seemed to get it kind of back in the mainstream, and but of a higher, high quality back in the mainstream, not just a, off the top of my head, the Wishmaster, something like that. Yeah. Which, um, and as we were saying earlier, the kind of callbacks to your classic horrors and the tropes um, and how it plays off of them is just fantastic. Um, it's it's probably in my top five of all time, the, the original, oh, wow. certainly. Yeah. yeah. As I say, I still have a weird relationship with it where I, I do flip between that and two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So I'm following on from what we were talking about before. Um, I know you're saying about, you know, I'm, again, like one of the people who I hadn't really seen any slashes before Scream. I'd seen some horror films. I might have seen Halloween, but n- nothing else. Yeah. But I think that it actually still works perfectly just on its own. I feel even with all the, the callbacks and the references, um, I think one of the things that makes it a, a great film is that you don't have to have all that knowledge to enjoy it. And like I said, when I watched it the first time, I didn't even understand what anyone was saying. <laughs> and it still made you know pretty much perfect sense. You knew I knew what was going on. Yeah. Um, and then rewatching it in a language I did understand, <laughs> still having not seen like Halloween or Nightmare on Elm Street at that point, even it's it it doesn't rely on sort of like you know winks and in jokes. It's like I think it's a really compelling and sort of tense, you know, and refreshing sort of new type of slasher by yeah. itself. Yeah, I mean, I, Scream's a, it's a masterpiece, let's be honest. Um, oh, wow. you know, That's... even coming out from a point of view of someone who'd watched lots of other horrors before that, it took horror back to what it should have been. You know, we'd gone through the 80s and all the rubbish slashes we were getting. I mean, everyone was just riffing on the same idea over and over again. Um, Our villains had become the heroes. So you you now had Freddy appear on lunchboxes. You had Michael Myers appear on lunchboxes. Even Jason Voorhees was appearing on lunchboxes. It's like, you know, all these murderers were now our heroes and there was no villains anymore. 
everyone watched slashes for the kills. There was no one else that yeah. cared about. You didn't care about any of the characters. Screen brought it back to the characters who were being murdered by this killer. And you felt something for everyone that was in there. And every death there is, you've got some connection to the character that got killed, which was yeah. missing from all of the other ones to a certain extent. Hmm. Um, it's only when you look at sort of the first one or two films of each of the franchises that you think, actually, I cared about some of those characters. After that, no. It's just fodder for the knife. Um, well, screen, well, they became uh, Final Batman. Destination. A lot of yeah. slashes, really, don't they? <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Just in it for the kills and the blood. But yeah, Scream brought something back to it that a, a proper sense of dread and fear. And as I said, that opening scene, I mean, it's that's proper horrific scene. Everything about Drew Barrymore's yeah. acting mm. in it is just, you feel everything that she's going through and it, it is properly scary. Um, there is, that, is, that is an homage as well, that opening scene. Yeah. I can't remember if I've got the name right. Uh, when the Stranger Calls, I think is what it's called. Mm. Yeah. Which is nasty let's be yes. honest it, yes. it's an extended version of that opening scene yeah. um but it's not really got that playfulness which scream has it's just played completely down the line by a brutal character who's he, he keeps on repeat, repeating the line would you please check on the children and it's just mm. nasty nasty <laughs> film i mean it's it's a throwback to, to psycho as well killing off your lead character most uh, um prolific actor within the first few minutes. Hmm. You know, Psycho does it to Janet Lee very early on, gets rid of Janet yeah. Lee. She was on all of the posters. Here you've got Drew Barrymore, who was at the front of every single poster that was gone for screen, and actually will kill her off in the first 15 minutes. It's it's a hmm. brilliant piece of filming to do that, and a, a brave choice from Drew Barrymore to take that role, because she was oh, really yeah. down to play Sydney. We mm-hmm. decided she didn't want to play Sydney, so it, it works from so many points of view. I can imagine at the time going to see that, and you have seen the, the advertisements, the posters. Yeah. Rue Barrymore was one of the biggest stars in the world at the time. Yeah. And the shock that people would have felt because big actors, especially coming off the back of the 80s, I think, as well, when you had your, your heroes and your protagonists being invincible and in their own way and having that kind of shock factor to open your movie, it was, it was been quite something. Yeah, yeah, that is an interesting mm-hmm. part of Scream as well. Yeah, you sort of uh, mentioned it there. Both you, Andy, and you, Gav, uh, the, the actual ghost face killers. Mm. I, I'd like to say, yeah, going into spoilers again, I'd like to say it was Stu that all of this happens to, but <laughs> he kind of gets his ass kicked. Um, he's, think, not a, he's not yeah. a graceful killer. I mean, I think that's yeah one of the things I think makes, you know, Mark Scream was like a real departure from those sort of 80s slashes where you have, you know, these sort of supernatural or like, you know, uh, like Friday the 13th starts off with, you know, just a normal human killer, but just escalates into Jason becoming some bizarre supernatural thing. You know, you have Freddy. um, And this is taking right back to, you know, the killers just being these, you know, just awful dorky guys you know who and again you can tell like i said it's no there's no sort of michael myers sinister sudden appearances it's like they're just you know flailing around it's, it's a slightly terrifying thing that even a killer that's so obviously fallible who can be tripped over and there's um there's actually a great kind of super cut of ghost face getting you know whacked in the face and falling over that you can look up on youtube uh sort of ghost face being clumsy even someone like that is is still capable of you know wreaking this real you know campaign of terror around the town and you know having these really it's a really physical uh, film that I think is a, a Wes Craven trademark. It's like you really feel that they're having a a really nasty physical fight when it's Ghostface and any of the victims. Mm-hmm. It's it's very visceral. Yeah, I mean the, the only thing on that angle that I've really got any complaint with is one kill. Uh, it kind of became, um, I guess, a meme before memes are really a thing. Was scary movie, um, the garage door kill, which <laughs> yeah. I'll be honest, I kind of call bullshit on. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that garage door would have just collapsed on her, and it had been <laughs> incredibly embarrassing. Yeah. But yeah. never quite work out how she dies either, because she gets her arms through, and she's sort of yeah. hanging half in and half out. It never mm-hmm. goes far enough to cut her in half. There's no blood. She's just dead. I think. So, how did she actually die in that door? I think it's one of the things that's kind of movie logic. Like, I don't know if someone would really die in that. It's like the elevator thing where you're half in and half out. 
Mm. And I'm like, I'm not sure if that would really happen either. But you just sort of accept that it's true (laughs) because it's the film. It kind of works for the clumsy thing, though, isn't it? I mean, he's like, well, that killed her. I don't know how, but job done. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's almost slapstick with him sometimes with with every ghost face. Yeah. Mm. I think that's Mm. the thing as well about ghost face, that through all of the films... He remains a constant sort of clumsy klutz, even though there's a different person supposed to be under the mask every single time. Mm-hmm. Um, it's probably quite the hard. Same, yeah. Exactly the same. yeah, it's probably quite tricky running around in the full cloak and you know with your <laughs> eyesight restricted in the mask. Like it probably would be quite tricky. Yeah, you that's why Michael Myers walks so slow because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. he can't see. Either. <laughs> the only movie uh, slasher that I've seen where the the, the killer so clumsy. I think was it the first prom night. Yeah, beyond that. Yeah, it's a rare thing. Also, people watch uh, prom night two. Hello, Mary Lou. It's. it's a I've, movie, I've seen right. I've seen prom night two, but not prom night one. Yeah, I think yeah. I'm sure I've seen That's them both great. at some point. I, I don't remember them being any good, to be honest. Oh no! Oh, prom two is two brilliant. Is, yeah. It's so much fun. It's, it's going from a uh, slasher to basically Nightmare on Elm Street in in one. Easy step. Excellent. It's it's wild. <laughs> <laughs> Both ones that have passed me by. Both prom nights. I've never never seen any of them. <laughs> I think there's about five of them. You know, it's, it's the eighties. It's, it's yeah. a slasher. Mm-hmm. They just got carried away and just made so much money through caution to the wind. Yeah. Um, I've got to ask this because it's it's been a while since I've seen it, and the dialogue's a bit full on, isn't it? <laughs> Well, that, that was why it was done. I mean, Kevin Williamson was doing what Dawson's Creek at the same mm. time was writing mm. this. He was brought on as someone who could write teenage lines for 30-year-olds, which is pretty much what this is. Yeah. Um, and I think famously in the script, every time there's a kill, it just says, Wes will sort this out. <laughs> <laughs> Williamson just wrote words and had children, well, teenagers speaking in a way that teenagers never have before and probably never will again. Mm-hmm. Um, they're just, that's yeah. how Kevin Williamson sees kids speak. There's a, I, I'm going to probably up, upset one of you, or maybe all of you <laughs> here, but there's a way to do this and there's a way not to do it. I think this is probably the better way to do it. I think um, Joss Whedon is the wrong way to do it because it gets a bit obnoxious and you get terms like, is it weed? Oh, what's the term they use? Weeding? Weeding Weeding-esque. Yeah, Weedon-esque. And no. I think, I, I, I like a wee bit of Weedon. I'm a big uh, MCU fan. Obviously, the man's an asshole, which is, oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> came out just fairly league. recently. Just but, yeah. just the league. Yeah, you. and then he's 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 clearly just a, a toxic character. Mm. I think his writing certainly feels of the of its time. But the Kevin Williamson script for Scream, like... It, it still feels f- maybe not f- maybe fresh is the wrong word when you watch it nowadays, but it holds up a lot better than a lot. I think a lot of Whedon's style of writing. Um, yeah. It is over the top, as ridiculous. I mean, Billy Loomis's first introductory <laughs> line. It's like I was sitting watching The Exorcist at home, and I thought of you. <laughs> and it's like, well, that's a fucking insult. And she goes, "Oh, that's nice." Yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I think it works in a way. Like the dialogue, it is very stylized. But I think one of the reasons I think it works for me is that it's quite stylized around like character tropes, which again is you know obviously is you know riffing on you know on these slasher tropes. So you have you know Randy the nerd. Uh, you know, Billy is the sort of brooding, you know, ridiculous kind of boyfriend. You know, Stu is the goofball. So they've all got their own kind of stylized dialogue. Um, and like Tatum is, you know, the sort of arch, like, you know, witty sort of one. Mm-hmm. But I think because they fit into those tropes, which the, you know, the screen films are really riffing on, I think that's why it still works and doesn't seem quite as dated as you know, some weird dialogue or even Dawson's Creek, which I think felt a bit weird at the time when I was watching it. I'll be honest though, for me, it's it just remarkable how much of it I remembered. I don't know if I let that a testament to how well structured and how well written it is, but it's, like I said, it's the first time I've seen it in at least five, ten years. Yeah. And it was like, I'd watched it previously yesterday. And I don't know many mm-hmm. horror movies that are that sort of um, cleanly put together, I guess is a, a way I'm trying to think. Yeah. I think part Maybe. of that's because it's it riffs on so many other films to a certain extent, and then it's also been spoofed 
by so many other films. Yeah, I'm so surprised it, it still holds its power despite it. Yeah. Like Scary Movie doing its very, very best to kill it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was originally called Scary Movie as well. That was oh, the original, yeah, that the original title on the script, and it's ironic that later on they brought out a, a scary movie to riff on it. Yeah, mm. Mm. I think what makes it hold up quite as well is um, Wes Craven never. There's, there's elements of comedy and everything through it. Wes Craven never makes the deaths, so maybe apart from Tatum and the and the Gary's door, but he takes his violence seriously, mm. Yeah. Mm. which. Is when you get to, I think we mentioned Final Destination earlier on, it's a lot of kind of ridiculousness and you chuckle at certain kills and things, but Wes Craven was never, I mean, there's always the there's the, the story of him walking out of Reservoir Dogs because he thought it was just disgusting what he was watching on screen. And he's always sees violence as being something not necessarily to celebrate, but to actually shock. And that's the the opening scene with Drew Barrymore, it's such a brutal scene where she's so close to getting to her parents. And, yeah, I think that helps it definitely kind of have that impact and have that lasting effect on you. Yeah. Mm. It's, it's, it's the same as true of the ending as well when, uh, again, open about spoilers here, this try to injure each other, uh, Stu and Billy, mm. to, mm. you know, uh, evade suspicion. And that's a, a great example of that scene where violence is, is very real, what happens to Stu in particular. Mm. It's great yeah. performance as well, just a very physical performance there, which I think is an aspect of this. It's kind of underrated as a piece, as a vehicle for performances, Scream. There's some great stuff in there. Mm. Yeah, I, I think mm. all of the actors in it are, are doing a fantastic job. Um, they, all, they all carry their, their work very, very well. Um, and as you were saying about you know violence and whatever else, it's never something that you feel is glorified. It's not like the slashes that we had leading up this, where you wanted the kill. Because when these kills come, uh-huh. you actually you, you you feel something for the characters, and I think that's why the violence works in a different scale. And it is Wes Craven's thing that he gives you characters that you actually care about. So when they get killed off, there's more of a feeling to I, I've just lost a character that I did feel something for. And the, the way the actors are then acting it makes that even better. So, yeah, I think there's um there's a bit say like related to, you know, taking the violence seriously. I think also the fact that Scream has, you know, it examines. I think you know violence having real consequences, like the fact it opens up in the timeline as you know Woodsboro already being a place you know notorious for, um, you know, the murder of um Sydney's mother and Gail having already you know, written this book and it's, it's showing, you know, I think it is, is it a year later yeah. um, that, you know, this is still having, you know, huge consequences for like the whole town, especially for Sydney. Um, and it's, you know, that kind of legacy of violence is, is having these kind of, you know, real knock on effects. Um, and I think, yeah, that ties in as well with this, you know, where's Graven in this taking violence seriously and not seeing it as a kind of, you know, throwaway thing and like you know all the deaths even the ones we don't see have have meaning and sort of real repercussions for the characters mm. i think yeah. as well with it there's such a an aggression with their their violence that they carry out it's not like a michael where he stabs someone lifts them up and they just go limp and kind of choke a wee bit, but there's like the, the death of the Henry Winkler's um, principal. He's screaming as he's getting stabbed, he's shouting, he's got fear. Mm. That's it. It's it's um, less, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Less dramatised, if that's correct. Mm. I, I, I maybe not using the right <laughs> word there, but... An incredibly matter-of-fact sort of. Like yeah, weight. yeah. Yeah. And that's a, a Henry Winkler's character. I totally forgot about that as well. He's mm-hmm. a character that could probably have only existed in the nineties because the idea of a principal being like that, yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he'd be chopped up and sold off. You know? <laughs> um, Possibly, yeah. But it's um, any sort of closing thoughts on Scream? Anything that you I, you wanted to say? Just yeah, just as a launch pad as well of of this whole franchise of sequels, which I think all have their, you know, are all incredibly strong. Um, I haven't seen them all now. They're, 
it's quite, you know, it's fairly remarkable achievement, I think, to have a kind of four or five strong uh, run of films, you know, with some of them with almost a decade in between, yeah. especially with this idea where, you know, you think maybe with Scream being, you know, doing this kind of meta horror self-referential thing that would tire easily and they'd become kind of parodies of themselves. But I mean, some people might disagree. I think the whole Scream franchise has kept, you know, very strong and has yeah. done an interesting has taken an interesting angle on, you know, horror fandom, on, you know, media consumption, all kinds of, you know, different issues around horror films. And I think has managed to still keep up with having having a sort of fresh take at things, despite, you know, 20, is it 25 years now since Scream came out? Um, and, you know, up to five films, which I think is, you know, just a great achievement, I think. I think it, mm. it, it's, it is that meta element to it. He did obviously tried meta with the next film we're going to talk about um two years earlier but the way he did this and putting it was the first time we'd ever had horror happening in a world where horror films exist and i think that's the thing that's the lasting legacy of it that now when they make a horror film they think well actually people know the rules so let's let them know the rules and have them being a world where horror films actually do exist and people know about them and they've got something to sort of look back on and go yeah I mean, when you think about your Jasons and your Michaels, they're all living in these worlds where there weren't serial killers like that, so we don't know what's going on. So they do run upstairs and lock themselves in the bedroom, or they do go down at the dark cellar at night and whatever else. These kids don't do that because they know that's not what you do in a horror film, so they do something else. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of similar to what uh, Melissa was saying, the way the, the whole franchise has kind of kept itself fresh. When you look at Scream 4 especially, that was even possibly a bit ahead of its time with its way that it depicted um, the the kind of the killer at the end wanting to be a social media star and this was in 2010, so like Instagram oh, things yeah. like that, they were there and, and she wanted to be an influencer and be a, like a reason for that and then tackling and things like Scream 3 with possibly kind of the way the, the Weinstein thing had went. The Scream yeah, 3 yeah. was ahead of its time tackling toxic producers and toxic film companies and things like that. And I just think that speaks about Wes Craven. I mean, you always hear that he's one of the nicest men, the nicest directors to have worked with. And it seems like he's in the background just getting a feel for everything that's going on in, in, in Hollywood and in horror and he makes and, and, and even in, in, in life in general and he makes a, a great um, kind of companion piece to what's going on at that time Yeah I guess uh, yes, there's been a few mentions of legacy there so I, I know this isn't an easy question to answer it could spawn its own podcast all on its own this one question but what is the legacy of Scream? Oh, I've been, I've been, been legend. Kind of, <laughs> <laughs> you what I was saying, I think it's it's that giving us a world where, or building a world where the actors in it or the characters we're seeing on screen know that horror already exists. So yeah. we've got characters that live in a world where there are horror films. So the fact that it's happening to them now, they're more scared by the fact it's happening but less scared because they think they know the rules. Yeah. Uh, and it, I think that's what it gave to the horror world. It, it reinvented the horror world to a certain extent and revitalized the, the slasher horror. You know, mm -hmm. you think about all the things that came after it, where, you know, I know what you did last summers and all that type of thing. It, they were all came about because of Scream. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Anything to add to that? Anyone? No, I mean, <laughs> it just yeah, it, it, um, it revitalised the slasher as, as Gab was saying. It just gave it a new lease of life, for better or for worse. <laughs> um, and obviously, the noughties kind of took a bit of a turn towards maybe more visceral, nasty, and different types of filmmakers. But Scream certainly put horror back on a the pedestal it should be on. I think anyway. Yeah, yeah, it's it's and it's it's reputation, without mm. a doubt. Okay, uh, Melissa, anything left between what they have said? <laughs> I don't know if it's a legacy because I can't off the top of my head think of 
any sort of particular films that have followed in its footsteps. But I think just for the screen films itself, I think the you know Drew Barrymore's role sparked off like a a wonderful run of um, some sort of cameos and stunt casting um, in those films. I can't think if, if the sort of what bled out into the genre in general, but you know you have some great actors playing sort of smaller parts or themselves or like Carrie Fisher's <laughs> really good Scream 3 cameo um, as a sort of Carrie, Carrie Fisher reluctant lookalike. <laughs> um, so that's again, that's just something that Scream 1 kicked off for its own franchise, I think. Yeah. That's a lot um, of fun. Um, should I ask this? Yeah, I'll ask this here. <laughs> um, Scream 5, Scream 2022. How does that live up to the original? I had, I would have it just behind uh, one and two, for me. Mm, okay. Yeah. Um, if we were to do a ranking, it was a kind of one slash two, five, four and three is the way I kind of would go with it. Um, I haven't rewatched really it, so I just got the feeling of seeing a screen movie in the cinema, um, which maybe colours my judgment a little bit, but. At the time of watching it, I absolutely loved it. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, I think it's done what Scream Four tried to do, which was to create this new sort of what they call it now a, a, a requel. They call it, yes. I think it is. Yeah. I think which they use that term in the movie yeah. as well, don't they? Quite, I think quite so, a lot. yeah. Like I think a legacy. What Scream Four was trying to do was to bring Scream back and bring a new <laughs> cast of characters in and go right. We can continue now with a new franchise without Sydney, and I think Scream. Well, it's Scream again, isn't it? It's Scream 5. I was going to call Scream 5. <laughs> five uh, Cream. I wish they'd kept with the name of Five Cream, because Five Cream was such a five great cream. name for it. <laughs> and it looked really good on the posters. Yeah. <laughs> but they didn't go with it. Hey. Um, I think it's brought that ability that they can do a Scream 6 quite happily and actually have Sydney not be part of it. And I think it would still actually work. I think yeah. the thing with all the Scream films so far is it's it's Sydney's film. Mm. It's never been about Ghostface. It's about Sydney. And that's something that is different from every other horror, that mm. the hero is the person that lives on, the final girl is the one that lives on from episode to episode to episode, rather than the villain of the piece. You know, if you look at Nightmare on Elm Street, it's Freddy that's in every single one. Yeah. Um, it's not Heather, so it, you know, it, or Nancy, rather. So it, she comes back now and again, but she's not the main character, whereas Sydney's there all the way through. Mm. Yeah, I think just in terms of yeah, the fifth, the fifth screen, screen five, <laughs> living up to it. Okay, I, I don't feel like in a way, sort of. Obviously, I saw it in the cinema, but I've very obviously only seen it once. Um, most of like the other screen films I've rewatched, you know, quite a few yeah. times. So in a way, it's it's sort of lower down the rankings, and I think it will maybe end up just because I'll probably end up getting that and rewatching it too. But yeah, like I said, I think it's it really did. It was a kind of a good job of threading the needle of bringing back the legacy characters, but still having, you know, having a much, I think, more a sort of coherent, solid younger cast than Scream 4. Although I really love Scream 4. It's one of my, my favourite ones. Um, but it's maybe not, yeah, that that younger cast doesn't, it feels a little more tacked on than I think this most mm. recent sort of gang did. And I think, yeah, it was really interesting. I think I really like the idea still of it, you know, of them having to deal with living in Woodsboro, which is just, you know, this yeah. horrifically uh, <laughs> traumatized place. And how, and again, it's it's still continuing. One of the things yeah. I mentioned earlier about this having, it still has consequences, even all these years later in, in the town of Woodsboro. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we get, we're getting a Scream 6 next year, aren't we? It's starting filming in the summer. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. At, the very, at the very, very least, it's. It's much better than the uh, the Halloween new movies that they've been doing. I'm not a fan of those whatsoever. It, it, it's getting a bit more to the heart of what made Screen tick, this new one. Yeah. Well, I think Halloween it went the wrong way by going, we'll just completely retcon everything we've ever done before and go, this happens after Halloween part one. Mm. And everything else that happened would just didn't really happen. We'll just do something different. And I know they've done it a couple of times during that franchise, but at least Scream's addressing everything that ever happened. Including yes. what happened before Scream itself, the kind of done thing to do just now with the new Texas Chainsaw, and I mean, I really like the 2018 Halloween. Um, I absolutely despised Halloween Kills and everything about it. Oh, yeah. um, but 
the 2018 one, I quite like that idea. Maybe a bit flawed with if this is it was more for me than what with the, the lorry aspect of it as well. You know, she's great in it. Um, but yeah, there was one thing I was wanting to ask if you guys know when is the first time it actually gets called Ghostface? Because I think it's a really rubbish name. And is it four? Like he's never just mentioned in the first one. I'm trying to think of a time at all when they, rather than just the us as the actual yeah. viewers, do you, I'm trying to think when, is it not, doesn't Tatum say something in the the scene in the basement, in one? Isn't she saying like Mr. Ghostface? She calls Mr. Ghostface, yeah. yeah. Right, okay. And she's like taunting him. The costume's him. not a Ghostface costume because they have a version of the costume at one point in the film. Uh, and I can't remember what it says mm. on the costume cover that they hold up and go, this is the, the Halloween costume. Um, uh, but yeah, I think oh, it is Tatum calls him Mr. Ghostface. Mr. Ghostface, yeah. yeah, she's sort of having a little jibe at him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just one of that's always bugged me about it because I go, it's a really rubbish name for him. <laughs> <laughs> Even though Michael Myers is just, that's his name, and Freddy Krueger, yeah. that's just his name. Ghostface just sounds a wee bit shit but, <laughs> you know, but it gets fully referenced I think in, in Scream 4 they're literally calling him Ghostface and then they'll mention it in 5 as well I waited over an hour I'm sorry for over an hour I waited yeah well most people have friends who give them a lift home mom and dad wouldn't have forgotten to pick me up you want to drop it Billy, what's up? middle section taking a little break from Andy, Melissa and Gav just to set up what's coming usually. I made a little scheduling snafu so it was planned to be um, Craven, Audiard, Craven making Audiard something of a sandwich filling but in a Craven sandwich. Didn't really work out that way. Scheduling snafus happen. It's, it's perfectly fine. They'll happen again in the future. Um, so in this part, I'm, I'm just going to basically ask what you think, really. Um, the movies that we covered for Wes Craven, which include The Last House on the Left, Cursed, uh, Scream, and as we're going to do when we come back from this little mini break, A New Nightmare. What do you think of, of those movies? What are your opinions? What are your takeaways? I would love to hear from you. Um, let's open a, a, a conversation on this, shall we? If you want to get in touch and, and talk about this, um, any comments that I'll get will pop up in the mid-break on the next episode where we will eventually be doing Jack Audiard. So you can get in touch through email at directorsuncutpod at gmail.com. That's directorsuncutpod at gmail.com. Or you can call in me on social media. That's underscore RJ Simpson. That's underscore uh, J Simpson on both Twitter and Instagram. But now to jump into the bread and butter of podcasting, which is basically asking you to consider subscribing wherever you get your podcast if you've enjoyed what you've heard so far. And if you have a few minutes to spare, give the show a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, and preferably a five star. That'd help out a podcast in its taking its baby steps out in the world. Or if you listen on Spotify, if you've listened to, I believe if it's more than 30 minutes of a podcast, you can rate any podcast that you've listened to. I think it's click on the three dots and it'll give you an option to rate a podcast. So if you gave us a five star rating there too, that would be fantastic. But if you don't have the means or the time to do either of those things, sharing is caring. Share it with your friends on social media, Instagram, Twitter. Tag me too so I see it. And uh, yeah, any of those ways will help get more eyes and ears on a podcast. 
And if you want to support independent podcasts, which more people should, yeah, that is the best way to help small podcasts out. So yeah, let's jump straight into part two of the episode in which we talk about 1994's Wes Craven's New Nightmare. Dylan! Oh, I'm sorry. What happened to you? Are you alright? I'm fine. Have you seen Dylan? Take Where is he? Take it easy. Take it easy. Relax. He's right there. What happened? Oh, Dylan. Oh, God. What's going on, Heather? What in the world happened? I know how Chase really died. What do you mean? Fred Krueger did it. Into the second movie of the night. Uh, I think it was the one uh, Wes Craven made before New, uh, Scream. <laughs> yeah. Two years um, before. Not New long. Nightmare. So who wants to take a stab at this incredibly complicated uh, synopsis? Oh, I think I can do this. I did the last one. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go with the evil that lives within film has found a way or wants a way to get back into the real world and has decided the only way it can do it is by creating a film through the nightmares of the writer Wes Craven. Hmm. There you go. Thanks. You took a very diplomatically easy way out of that because <laughs> there's a complicated version of that synopsis and there's the easy way out of it. Hey, come on! <laughs> I could have gone into the fact he tried to create a brand new meta universe to do with Freddy Krueger, but you know. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is the first time I've seen this. Uh, and I think it's great, but I will say one thing. It suffers from third actitis. Uh, yeah. Yes, it probably I does, don't yeah. know. Yeah. Um, it suffers from lots of things. It suffers <laughs> well, from well, trying yes. to rewrite the whole history of Freddy Krueger. To go back to what Wes Craven wanted it to be in the original, and he well, lost he, through all the other versions. So you can't blame him because, as we no. highlighted at the top of the show, uh, Freddy Krueger became he was on like uh, lunch boxes and rap mm-hmm. videos. He would lost any impact that he ever had, really. Yeah, I think but, the only way maybe the, the third act could have been more meta is if you like beat him over the head with Freddy Krueger lunchbox or trapped him inside <laughs> it or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and then Wes Craven just sets it on fire. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, fire. yeah, I don't know. I feel like I'm not really biased. I just like it. Basically, I I think it. I I love this film like start to finish. I think pretty nice. much it's it's genuinely one of my favourite films. Um, it's you know, it's like. Yeah, it's it's ridiculously over the top meta, but it is completely over the top, and it's you know it, it's reflected through you know the score and the writing and everything, and it's like <clears throat> yeah, it, it disappears into yeah layers and layers of itself, but that's yeah. it's, it's it does it in such a kind of um, I think you know such an exuberant way that it just it for me anyway it just sort of sweeps you along with it and just, yeah, just to get into the fine detail, I think uh, there's a point. I mean, it's got John Saxon in, and John Saxon's great in anything. Um, well, there's a scene where it segues from being in reality to when the film. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You kind of felt that becomes, just before it kicked off. And that point, up until then, I think it's pretty much the perfect 1990s horror movie. Mm. It does so many things really, really well. Mm. Uh, the dread, it puts fear back in. It makes uh, Freddy Krueger a real nasty shit. Mm. Freddy's redesign in it, I think, is great. Yeah. Oh yeah, like his the change in his like his facial scarring has new. It's not a, even really a glove. It's like a it's part of his hand. It's like an animatronic part of his hand yeah, that he's got involved. It makes it's like him, a screw on hand, isn't it? Yeah, and mm-hmm. it also <clears throat> it doesn't turn up for the first hour, which yeah. is <laughs> yeah. You really you don't see his face until about an hour in the movie, yeah. and which is. Because everyone, again, we talk about uh, Wes Craven kind of defying expectations with killing Drew Barrymore and the opening of Scream. Mm. People would have went going to see the Freddy movie probably thinking, oh, we're going to see Freddy turn up and he'll kill someone in the first scene and that'll be it. You don't really see anything like that. It's all kind of cloak and dagger. If it's dreams, if it's just you see the claws, that's it really right at the start. And for the first hour, yeah, it's, it's... yeah, I, I absolutely love this. It's my mm-hmm. favourite of all of them. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. The the bit where, you know, when he really does, it comes up again as he 
yeah, I did in sort of the original one, like through the sheet, and he sort of yeah. rips through the sheet with the claws, which is, you know, another thing I love about this and the first one is that how how physical the kind of barrier between real life and dreams is in these yeah. films. And that moment, yeah, the score is like going off basically, and you know, Freddie just emerges again in this like you know long trench coat with the like you said the new kind of scarring. Yeah, and it's think, like yeah. genuinely like a really terrifying moment, which yeah, like I said, having grown up in the era of Freddy lunchboxes, I do, you know is is really surprising to be like this is a new nightmare on Elm Street that is really scary. It's when you say you uh, don't see Freddy till an hour in, you've got Robert Englund jumping out of the TV show. Well, yeah, as <laughs> Freddy. I mean, come on, that, that's well, that, that, Freddy, is, cle- that is clearly <laughs> him <laughs> having a pop, isn't it? It is. He's having a pop at what Freddy Krueger became. Uh, yeah, be absolutely. <laughs> that's a brilliant scene. That where he, he they have the TV show going. You know, ten years since the film, and he, he comes up there. Ah, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I kind of love it. Um, which is interesting because I've only seen the first one in this, so <laughs> I think that might actually... any of the others. No, because oh, uh, right. I'll be honest, uh, up front here. I've not seen any Hellraiser, wow. none, because when I was a kid um, at the local video shop, little little Rob walked in, <laughs> big standee of Hellraiser. <laughs> oh my god, that is terrifying! <laughs> <laughs> and I never got round to it. And it was just one of those uh, things as well. <clears throat> I never touched any Nightmare on Elm Street because it's uh, this a certain class of movie where. It's become so, I don't know what word this, so uh, consumed into the public consciousness that mm. you've seen it without actually seeing it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Can is it, there's, there's a lot of 80s horror, or, and they include Michael Myers as well, obviously, 70s, but um, like Chucky as well was always one yeah. I knew of. They were, they were franchised, they were marketed in a certain way. I mean, Chucky was a child killer. And hmm. they were still marketing them certain aspects yeah. of him towards kids, and then he became a bit of parody of himself. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like Freddy, I knew of him, and I, I had a recurring nightmare about him actually when I was younger, <laughs> but I'd never seen anything. <laughs> and then it's it's just that element of the way these characters just kind of ingrain themselves because they're so memorable, which is obviously a good thing. But yeah. Um, Dream Warriors is good. You should watch that. I like Dream Warriors. Oh, I've set <laughs> yeah. myself a challenge of going through a lot of the blind spots of horror, and I think Dream Warriors is one of them. So, yeah. Hellraiser is, um, you're saying you've never seen that. It's a very, I think the way Pinhead has, has been made, uh, I'm obviously going to be a bit of tangent here, sorry, but no, the, okay. the way, the way Pin, Pin, Pinhead is so memorable. You watch mm. that first, Hellraiser movie and it's a really adult horror movie I think is the mm. best way to describe yeah. it. It's all sex and bondage and nastiness Weirdness. and yeah, yeah and Pinhead it's really not in it much so you'll be uh, alright you're quite no, safe from it. It's mainly a Julia. Yeah. 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 The, the book The Hellbound Heart's fantastic and it's, been, mm. it's a really a tough read there. Tough, and a tough mm. watch I think the first one. Yeah mm. it is. Very different yeah, than the rest of the series. It's mm-hmm. amazing how uh, it just stands up on its own. I don't think you actually need to have seen any hell um, Nightmare on Elm Street really for this to be just a really powerful um, movie, effectively about a mother mm. trying to protect their mm. son. Yes, yeah, yeah. Because the, it's kind of—I mean, it, it's a bit of a big swing here, but you could say that this is—it would make a great companion piece to the Babadook. Mm. Yeah, mm-hmm. so the Babadook is essentially yeah. about a kid. One reason you can take of it is a kid who has autism and he's very, very bad at expressing that and expressing yeah. himself. And it, he just gets very tense, a situation, because he just gets worse and worse and worse. Yeah. Until the, the mother kind of loses it. There's a parallel there with the kid in, in this too, mm-hmm. I think. I'm taking a big swing. I might be completely wrong. It's but a big swing, but I think you can you can probably make it, yeah. 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 I'd like to see it as a um, double, <laughs> double bill. To be also, it's an mm-hmm. amazing double bill. I mean, Freddy versus yeah. Babadook. Yeah. <laughs> no, that'd be an interesting one. Yeah. That'd be better than Freddy versus Jason. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I liked that at the time, but then it's aged terribly. There's so much oh, like it's not like it. Oh, there's so much um, age terribly. Yeah. It just was terrible. <laughs> oh no, the language in it is really, really bad. <laughs> like yeah. it's so much racist language and no yeah. language oh. at all. Oh. But I was, I was, I was a 15 year old in 2002 when it came out. So there was violence and uh, there's, there's maybe harsh as this. There's violence and boobs. 15. Yeah. 
It's what fifteen year old was. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like <laughs> that was. I was. Yep, yeah, that'll do. <laughs> I think. Yeah, I think I saw it, and I was just. I mean, I, I don't know if I'm misremembering. I was scandalised that uh, Jason won. I was like, no way. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Same as Alien versus Predator. I was like, there's no way an alien is losing this fight, <laughs> but they made it so. Just- does Jason win? Does Freddy, yeah. is Freddy's head well, not actually yeah. still alive at the end? Yeah. Does it not grin and wink? And then yeah. it cuts out. Maybe. I think Jason wins Jason wins the fight, isn't he? Because there's a, there's the, they always seem to make Jason sympathetic. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. he's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why? I don't know. He's a fucking zombie with a machete. I don't want that coming after you. <laughs> I think they try to build it up with Freddy versus Jason versus Ash as well. Try to yeah. make the whole thing out of that. That was going to be the next one, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah it was um, comic, wasn't it? I think yeah, so. It, yeah. It, it's how they put it out in the world eventually. But yeah, New Nightmare and uh, the Babadook. I think there's some yeah. um, stock there, really. And I won't use a ridiculous term like elevated horror because I'm not <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking yeah. of Stream Five, I, yeah. But yeah, on like on the subjects, so yeah, the. Uh, the little boy, how is it Dylan in the film? Mm, um, yes. Again, it's like, I I thought I rewatched this the other day and I was like, I'm sure I recognize him. And I was like, oh, it's me. I think it's Miko Hughes, who's from Gage and the original Pet Cemetery film. Um, is who was in, you know, yeah. So he was in, in Pet Cemetery. He was really small, like three or four. Mm. Um, I think I just, I think it clicked when towards the end of the year, I think he stabs Freddie's leg. And I was like, <laughs> Yeah, I've seen you stabbing someone's leg before <laughs> in Pet Cemetery. But I think he's like for such a young actor, like I think he's really yeah. great. Some of his mm. especially when he's screaming and it's just, you know, it's it's quite a sort of rending, like a real you can he's putting the terror across, I think, in his performance. And he's in it a lot as well for such yeah. a is, such a yeah. young actor. He's a creepy little shit. <laughs> he's he really creepy. Yeah. It's now that you've mentioned that he's Gage as well. But... <laughs> oh, like, I used to have Freddy nightmares when I was younger. I'm in my thirties. I'm going to start having Gage. that wee boy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. yeah, any I don't know to pick up from that. Really, honestly, <laughs> uh, no, I mean Fred. Freddy has always been this larger than life character. And mm-hmm. I think um, this film perfectly takes the mick out of it enough to go, you know what? Yeah, we know he became this larger life character, but actually we can make him scary again. And it does oh, yeah. a good job of trying to make him scary again. I mean, you know, this is a guy that he had a TV series. You know, this yeah. Freddy's Nightmares was a TV mm-hmm. series that was running that he was trying to do what little horror clips, everything. But the character that Robert Englund was playing of Freddy in that is so away from anything that was in any of the, the horror films that were going on that he was in. You know, he was I, a friend, almost a friendly character. Am I remembering a cartoon, or is this just another weird fake memory? Is that Rick the, and Morty? I, <laughs> I think there was a cartoon of it as well, but mm-hmm. I, I know there was a TV series, Freddy's Nightmares, where it was almost like um, Tales from the Crypt type thing. So yeah. Freddy came yeah. on in his little box and said, today's story's about, and you know, brought on this horror story. But mm. he was this weird ramped up version of the Freddy Krueger we'd had that was already at a point where it was on lunch boxes. So mm-hmm. yeah, I, I think this brought it back to being something that was properly scary again. Cause I mm-hmm. think compared to the other ones, it is scary. Mm-hmm. It the is, first yeah. film is scary. This one's scary. The ones in the middle aren't quite as scary. They're, they're almost cartoons of themselves. They kind of, they almost go sci-fi. Yeah. Away from horror and lean more into a kind of sci fi type thing with the Dream Warriors and the Dream Child, yeah. which is. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you've got parody. I, I don't know if you're thinking of the, the Rick and Morty parody of them, mm-hmm. where the guy just mm-hmm. always says, yeah. bitch, bitch, bitch. And that is literally. But, but that's what Freddy became. Yeah. And that is mm-hmm. what his tagline was. He just, he just be misogynistic, <laughs> which was his whole shtick. But they classed it as funny because it was the eighties. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> it was a simple time. It was a stupid <laughs> time. <laughs> Get away with anything in the eighties. <laughs> mm. I was gonna time. Yeah, just sort of off off on another tangent really. But um my own sort of just when I was watching it the other day and thinking about it, my own kind of like big, you know, bit of swing or reach is I don't know if you could consider this film specifically as a kind of like a cosmic horror. Basically, because mm-hmm. I think within the film, Wes Craven and Heather, 
when they're having a talk about, you know, he's he's explaining his script and what's going on with it. And essentially he's within the film, he says that there is there's this entity, it's not actually Freddy, it's an entity mm. who's sort of embodied him, decides that he likes him, and that what they have to do in order to basically they have to use like, you know, will you play Nancy one more time? We've got to make another film to kind of contain this this entity. And the whole thing was like Freddie not being scary anymore was actually, you know, letting it is a kind of like cosmic horror, unknown, unknowable mm. sort of entity by the sounds of it mm. that just looks like Freddie for now, kind of, you know, like uh, Pennywise in it. It's the sort of, it's not really Pennywise the clown, it's something yeah. else. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's a lot in the film as well. I just felt of the kind of reading the script, reading, you know, bedtime stories as Heather Dunn is very, it's done in a very kind of like an incantation way. Like at the end, they're saying the lines from Hansel and Gretel. And um, it's, yeah, it's all got a very kind of, yeah, cosmic horror, slightly occult flavor, which is, mm. you know, really interesting for what is, you know, part of like a, a slasher genre sort of film. Yeah. Which I thought was really get, interesting. You get the, um, the kind of final form of them in the fire. Which yeah. is like some yeah. weird horned demon um, when the, the kind of fire melts away the, the essence of Freddy. Yeah, I, I think I think you're right. Probably with, with the cosmic horror aspect of it, kind of it did feel a bit kind of almost Lovecraftian and the unknown, mm. the indescribable, and these earthquakes that are happening all over LA that are mm. having an impact on the kind of day to day lives and yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love the yeah. Like I said, with it's the same with this, and I think Scream and the first Nightmare, like how physical it all is. You know, the like I said, they've got these earthquake things, which I looked up. Were actually some of the footage is after they filmed it, there was actually an earthquake in California, and they wow. where they were. So like when you see some of the damage, right. that's actually real. But it it feels you know for Heather like there's something physically coming through. You know, mm-hmm. from like I said, the dream yeah. worlds are very. I love there's there's a part of this where even when she wakes up it's like you see freddie's hand and it doesn't just disappear it has to actually go like like <laughs> drop down yeah. and it's like yeah. that's one of the things that i think makes it so effective how how sort of really physical the sort of dream world feels with all the sort of you know the gooey steps and the tongues coming out of the phone um yeah. mm. which again is all things that really loop back to the first film yeah. and make this kind of there's a very circular film to this feeling to it it's sort of not just Wes Craven I guess going back to his own creation and trying to make it scary I think within the film itself it does feel like they're trying to encircle this entity and trap it by going back to the first one and recreating all these moments and you know trying to uh, yeah sort of keep it contained within a sort of a fictional realm as it were. Yeah. it's probably the best way to uh, like um, frame it really because as a, s- a slasher two kills really I think Any potential slasher fan would be quite disappointed by the number of, like those are kids from League of Gentlemen. I don't know if that reference still holds at all. How many kills yeah. has it got? Yeah, I think then there's two really on screen. There's two, two of the poor SFX guys who just get mentioned in a news story and they're like, yeah. Yeah. two guys were stabbed. Well, that, that, was the <laughs> issue. That's it. that was the issue when it came out, wasn't it? That the, the fans of the Freddy franchise to that point were expecting the same type of level of kills as it had through the past, what, five, six films. And they didn't mm. get it. They got this new thing that was something, as you said, actually, I think you're probably right, a cosmic horror of types that is scary in a completely different way. So there was selling it one icon, different one iconic kill, though. It does have one absolutely iconic kill with the babysitter. That's a good one. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's the best. The best shout, out to, shout out to Julie, who was an absolute legend in this film. Who does yeah. a does a great job with Rex, and then uh, I think yeah, the scene where she she sort of lamps the nurse who's <laughs> injected the kid with the sedative, and then has like a you know maybe a slight throwback to Dream Wars, like a kind of standoff with uh, with both got syringes. She's like, I know what's in that one, you don't know what's in this one, <laughs> and it just legs it, which is I thought was a great yeah, a little bit of a sort of scream style comedy in there, which I thought was that was a wonderful scene. So, the um, doctors in it are so evil sounding. <laughs> I thought yeah. they, they come across like the the villains of the movie, like the the psychiatrist, the, the, is, she, is she a psychiatrist, the jail psychiatrist that is clearly not believing Heather Langenkamp, and then those two in the in uh, Dylan's room, like we'll pretend we're going to jag him with this one, and then just come in from the side, <laughs> bang, go to sleep. <laughs> like, <laughs> 
<laughs> they're probably evil doctors, nurses, you're right there. Doctors often nurse. come off as evil in horror films, though. That seems to be a, mm. a trope for doctors in horror films. Mm. Oh, yeah, but she totally deserved that punch in the face. Like, oh, yeah. Definitely. Absolutely. Because <laughs> she looked really uh, proud of smug herself, didn't she? She looked really smug yeah. after they joined her. Like, oh. <laughs> I, think, yeah, I think the other one gets, like, elbowed in the gut by Heather Langham as well. There's a proper, like, nurse brawl. It's great. <laughs> okay. Um, it's kind of a very final word, though, isn't it? They did make a new one. Um, I can't remember the name of the guy. Uh, the guy from Watchmen, his name escapes yeah, me. Uh, good yeah, casting. Jackie, but... Jackie Earl Haley. Yes. Yeah. Uh, good casting, terrible film. But um, aside from that, what is the lasting like legacy of uh, Nightmare on Elm Street? Lunchboxes. <laughs> <laughs> Franchise things. Like, this is Borderlands, but it's Dreamlands with radio on it. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Merchandise. I think he's been he's been over merchandise probably, but it, it's a sad yeah. legacy for anything, isn't it? Really, but I think we could do with one. Personally, I don't know what the the tie ups and rights and things like that are for. I know that's why there's been a bit of an issue with um, making another Jason movie. Yeah. The Platinum Dunes, the Michael Bay production company, was going through a phase of trying to fire out mainstream horror that was cheap to make and still make money. Mm. Um, I, I bet if if they got the right the correct writers for it, and I think there's a lot of good horror writers around just now that could oh, yeah. do something with a character. Um, maybe an Ari Aster Freddy movie that could be something. Probably, probably horrible. It'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's just so much. Sc- you know, there could. I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but I'm not in the creative writing business. Yeah. But I think there's, with a character like Freddy, there is, because of his nature, because he's, he's not really bound by sort of, you know, physical, mortal things as, a, you know, as he is inhabiting this kind of dream world, there's so much scope to be created with it. And I think that Wes Craven did show, with this film in particular, that you could take someone, like take Freddy, you know, who people I imagine had written off as just tired out and over merged and really reinvent him. Um, so I think yeah, that definitely would be interesting. Like if someone, you know, thought up a whole new take with Freddie, that could be a fascinating mm-hmm. project. Mm. It's, a, it's so- a difficult one to do though, to come up with something new to do with Freddie that hasn't already been done in the, the other films and still make it believe, well, not believable, but still make it scary to a certain extent. Um, <laughs> I think they've almost got to strip it right back to the start. Well, almost there's, a, it. there's a generation of uh, horror writers, fans, directors who grew up with Freddy, so yeah. mm, the yeah. time is right. I've seen them, um, yeah. I can't remember where I heard it, but someone described what if you put Freddy in space, but it's not actually, <laughs> but <laughs> the thing about this, it's not actually Freddy in space, it's when they go into cryo sleep. Yeah. And it's oh, someone yeah. that has a memory of him from maybe tales from a family member or something like that. And they go into cryo sleep, and the whole crew go into cryo sleep, and then you could do something like that. It sounds a bit shit, but Freddy in space, fuck it. I've seen the poster for Amityville in space. I mean, it's it's, it's better than that. that. <laughs> <laughs> I think we had we had made that. In space, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, well, yeah, I think you get there's definitely something you could do with them. I mean, remember, maybe that is Freddy what you do or, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or like um, you get a lot of sleep studies and things like that nowadays, don't you? You can yeah, yeah. bring them into something like that in a controlled environment, and it's someone trying to bring them back. As they sh- yeah, I think there's a lot you could do with them, but you need to get the right people for it. Indeed, um, you need to bring back the nastiness of them. Oh yeah, yeah. I think a uh, new nightmare totally did that. Uh, this is a hard question to ask, but I'm going to ask it anyway. But as a director, Wes Craven is in the entirety of his career. What is his legacy as a director? If anyone wants to take a swing at that, that's a big question, I know. I think it's horror that doesn't um, celebrate itself. So you have horror that is truly frightening, that isn't going, you know, we're just going to celebrate the nastiness of killing someone. It's horror that makes you feel something in there, that this is something that's properly scary. And maybe I'm watching, but I'm not sure if I want to watch sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, for me, um, he's a horror director who knows what horror films can be. He's a smart yeah. horror director, but 
there's that term that's get bandied around now, uh, smart filmmakers, and they mm. kind of lose the, the fun of what they're trying to make. But every movie that Wes Craven's made, it has that sense of danger and it has that sense of fun about it. I don't think there's a lot of people who really share that in common with him. Mm. They don't ever go what, to one, uh, too far one way or too far the other. I think yeah, there's. I think he's definitely got a feeling of not not being afraid to be quite bizarre. Um, I'm thinking for this more like uh, people under the stairs, which is completely bizarre, but mm-hmm. you know works incredibly. Yeah, this uh, new nightmare is such a like off the wall idea, um, but I think yeah, you know, holds together. But even even Scream, which is a you know, it's it's taking what's quite a standard teen thing, but giving it you know quite a risky maneuver in having everyone know about horror films um and have this odd bumbling clumsy serial antagonist which is again it's taking quite a step away from like uh the norms of the time so i think yeah not being afraid to sort of branch out and and be weird which i think is always a good thing i mean he he did serpent in the rainbow and you can get weirder than that yeah so yeah of course (laughs) i think he he did swamp thing (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> I think certainly with his movies he at least tries to do something different he's never massively critically acclaimed I don't think um, mm. but he makes movies that for him, certainly for himself he has tried to make a point like the um, the last house on the left was against the Vietnam War the the uh, What's the, the second movie I've taken out? The House of Eyes um, was about nuclear testing and nuclear war. Whether he's successful or not, he certainly tries to make something that makes you think. Um, mm. And he goes for it is maybe, uh, maybe a, quite a simplified version of describing what he'd done, but even Shocker is just fucking... Nonsense, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's it's he's an interesting filmmaker. I think if you discuss Wes Craven in 10 15 years' time, you would say, Yes, he's had Scream, he's had the introduction of Freddy, but he never just kind of rested on his laurels. Like Scream obviously made New Nightmare and he went on to make the, the three Scream sequels, but he was always someone who would try and do something a bit different. Hi, darling. It's me. It's the biggest day of my life today. If you could be thinking of me, maybe say a little prayer, I'd really appreciate it. Hello? Here we are. Magnificent. day I can see the real potential of this house. I'm here to discuss the terms of the agreement. Canapé? You have to nourish the soul of the house. Wonderfully elegant, isn't it? The family must take up residence in the house. Can we ask you some specific questions? I've invested my whole life in this house. What happened? <laughs> Don't be afraid. <laughs> oh, oh dear. This isn't the plan. I hate this house. Oh yeah. They are going absolutely nowhere. It's time to move on. Okay. Um. So final bit of the show. Away from the featured director, does anybody have any movies? Maybe it's related to a podcast you've done recently that you'd like to talk about. Anything you've seen recently? He doesn't even have to do movies; it can be TV. Oh, Wild yeah. idea, or not? See the Batman tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait. A bit early for the Batman then. <laughs> Beyond that, anybody? So, Ooh, I'm going okay. to see the Batman tomorrow, but um. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> The last movie I actually watched in cinemas was Nightmare Alley, which mm, okay. I really hated, and I love Guillermo <gasps> del Toro. I absolutely yeah. love Guillermo del Toro. Pretty much everything he's done, I was so bored. 
by the like I just oh, yeah. I maybe wasn't in the, the right mood for it. Maybe it's one of those movies I really disliked it. Like um and I said I don't know it'd be on a downer. But yeah, oh, I, no. I, I won't go into too much detail. I mean it, it's a Game of Delta movie, it looks great, it's fantastically shot, <clears throat> there's great performances, but I, I, um yeah. I mean, yeah. If it, oh, look, to pep it up a bit, I can see how it Night Rider is definitely. It's got a certain pace to it, which is its yeah. own. But I, I think it's one of these things. It's like this specific sort of type of plot. You either maybe just like it or you don't. Like for me, I was like, I love this kind of plot. <laughs> you know, with it, it was you know, I was like, I could, I could have just watched the whole stuff that's set in the circus for like two and a half hours and been totally yeah. happy. Um, Out of curiosity, have either of you seen yeah. the original? <laughs> the, the, on a positive. No, no, it, no I'm not I didn't even know it was a remake until after I'd seen it. I think, I think 1947 or something along those lines. It's a remake of, and apparently it gets mm. it, it's a very sexy movie. The 40s one apparently it gets rid of a lot of that, and it's quite mm. uh, unsexy. It's probably a better word than that, but <laughs> to hell of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, unsexy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. On a positive note, I watched the Guardians of Justice, which I thought was an absolute blast. And I've never um, heard of that. No, I've not either. Mm-hmm. So it's on Netflix, it's a TV show. All right. Uh, oh, okay. Seven episodes, roughly about 25 minutes an episode. It stars Diamond Dallas Page. Oh, TV. Who <laughs> apparently uh, is a wrestler. I've never heard that long. And yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the oh, protagonist from Your Next, the Australian. I can't remember the actress's name. Uh, Shani, Shani Venson or something, is that a name? Yeah. Oh, look Aye, yeah. It's a, it's a cross between... Um, so it's got live action, it's got anime, it's got uh, kind of basic animation, it's got claymation, it's got um, kind of Cuphead style animation. Um, if you know the game Cuphead and the TV show actually now Cuphead, and it's very eighties retro feeling, so kind of like Psycho Gorman, if you've seen that. Um, that is a cross between Watchmen and nonsense. <laughs> uh, there's a, a character, a marvelous man, who's been the protector of Earth for forty years, uh, commits suicide at the start of it, and his um, right hand man, who's Nighthawk, who's basically Batman, played by DDP, um, is trying to find out what happened. Um, it's kind of shit, but kind of good. <laughs> it's oh, one of those I, I, ones. I'm all about like stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A lot of eighties synth and things like that. Uh, you you mentioned Netflix there, so I'll I'll jump off of that one. Um, it's not quite recent, but it is one of the more recent original movies. Uh, the House that they did. Mm. I don't know if any of you seen that. Seen um, that no. Animated three piece uh, anthology movie based around a house. It's not this consistent house. It's not the same filmmakers. It's kind of like three shots put together uh, based around this idea of a house. Um, with animation, which it's puppetry and stop motion animation, and as an animated piece, it's absolutely stunning. And the first one um, is possibly it's about a, a house who's well, uh, some people who are on hard luck. They came from a good family, but they're on hard luck, and they get offered this great new massive mansion um, by a insane Dutch um, oh, name words. Professions, <laughs> the design buildings. It's architect. 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 There we go. <laughs> An insane Dutch architect. <clears throat> and that first shot is possibly one of the best pieces of gothic horror I've seen in, in years. It's it's stunning, absolutely stunning. Worth the price of admission for that one alone. Um, the second one uh, is about uh, it. The first one's all humans, and the rest are sort of anthropomorphic animals. Uh, the second one's about a uh, I think it's a, I forget the animal, but he's building up a house to sell on. Uh, and it ends up with some people moving in and not moving out and him losing his mind, which is not quite as as great. Um, and the third one is about um, post-flood. There's this, this house and the landlord, or landlady, I should say, is trying desperately to do it up, but the few tenants she has aren't paying. And it's about coming to terms with it's probably best to move on now, really. But the first shot, outstanding. The other two, less so. But I still think on the first, the strength of that first one, it's definitely worth checking out. 
Sounds interesting. Mm. Have to give it a look. Properly, properly creepy first first mm. uh, shot. Mm. Yeah, but, um, I mean, staying with with Netflix as well. I just quite recently, maybe a couple of weeks ago, watched um, Archive eighty one. I don't know if any of you've seen that uh, or I heard of it. Missed me as well. Yeah, it's stage. Uh, uh, I've not watched yeah, it, but I've listened to the whole podcast. The podcast great. It's weird. Yeah, no, I was like, I, I didn't realize it was a podcast until I think I watched all so I might go back and watch it but yeah it's um I think it's is it eight episodes around eight episodes or so of um it's sort of framed around it's like a set in two timelines with um they there's one of the main character who is I think an archivist at a museum in New York so he deals with um restoring film and he sort of receives all these tapes from a very wealthy person who insists that he goes off to a sort of cabin in the woods almost a sort of a highish tech bunker to analyze these tapes which are um are of a woman in the 90s in this building and then it's sort of so it's kind of like part found footage um and it sort of flips between the two timelines which become a bit um a bit less separated but i thought it was a it's a really interesting kind of you know real mash of different genres and things um but very like very intriguing uh, I cut at the end of episode four, the one which uh, Benson and Muirhead did, funnily enough. Mm. It ends with like a real great jump scare. And it just never continued after that. We're, we're finishing? I'd say so. I mean, again, it's one of these things that I can... It tick, basically it ticks a lot of my personal sort of boxes. Like, I love found footage. Mm. Um, I I don't want to sort of spoil it, but there's like some of the other genres that they blend in there are also some of my favourites, and it's a really interesting combination. Um yeah, it's like it's quite a slow burn, but it's it's something that um, I think melts go into. It's not perfect by any means, and it's sort of the ending slightly kind of peters out. But I think it's I think it's definitely worth finishing. I think it's worth time. If it goes to be the podcast, it's going to be fucking weird, man. <laughs> like, yeah, it's pretty weird. It is, yeah. the, the podcast just goes kind of cosmic. They like were talking about it earlier on. Um, yeah, the podcast mm-hmm. great while we're forcing. Oh, I have to yeah, check that out. Uh, yeah, Gav, I've, anything? I've, uh, I've got nothing close. really. Unfortunately, because of the um, the nature of my podcast, I'm just watching old classic films and too many of them. So I've got nothing new that I've been watching. Recently. Oh, it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't have to be new. Doesn't have to be new okay. at all. Uh, well, actually, the new 4K restoration of American Wealth in London is well worth buying and well worth watching because it's absolutely beautiful the way they've, re- they've restored it. Um, mm. I got a I copy of it and managed to go to somebody else's house because I don't have a 4K player. But it looks beautiful now, American Wealth. Yeah. I've not seen that in a very long time, actually. Oh, it still ha- it still stands up as probably one of the best werewolf movies ever made. Going on record here, best yeah. werewolf transformations <laughs> in The Howling, and I'm, I'm, I'm adamant about that. I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm sorry. American <laughs> Werewolf will beat that every single time. Honestly. But his skin bubbles. It looks so awful. His nose <laughs> Stretches out his hand, stretches his back, breaks. Come on! <laughs> <laughs> I just remember the actual last mo- movie I watched was a uh, Pig. Oh, yeah. I don't know if any of you've seen Pig yet. Oh yeah, I loved Pig. Oh, yeah, so good. It is so, Nicholas yeah. Cage is brilliant in it, like ridiculously yeah. good to levels that you never thought you maybe would get to again. But yeah, that was the last actual <laughs> yeah movie I watched on no TV. I think, uh, I think that's it really for me. Um, so that'll probably wrap up the episode quite nicely Mm. that's us for another episode thanks for sticking with us till the end if you have any questions or comments on the films we've covered recently or their makers we'd love to hear from you email me at directorsuncutpod at gmail.com Gav where can we find you online your other things you can find me on the My Favourite Film podcast uh, on Twitter that's at My Fave Film okay Andy um, I'm on the Road to Nowhere podcast. It's nowhere spelt with a K, which is a one K, um, <laughs> related to <laughs> the MCU. Um, and it's at Where Is Nowhere. And uh, Melissa? Uh, I mean, you can find my writing at uh, Ghouls Magazine, um, which I think is at Ghouls Magazine on Twitter. I also write for Moving Pictures Film Club, and you can find me on Twitter, just myself, at uh, at Chloe Oriel. Excellent. And I've been Rob Simpson, and that was Directors Uncut. Uncut.